And this is entitled, Living as Children of Light. So Ephesians 4, starting verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist in, on, in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's our scripture readings this morning. And is there children's church? Okay, children, this is a time to be dismissed for children's church. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much today for your word. Father, I pray that your spirit is upon this place as we read your word today. And Father, that we do not be just hearers of your word, but be doers only. And we just thank you so much for all that you've given us. We pray your blessings upon this day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we talked about a passage from James 3 and the power of words and how they can be very dangerous and the impact that they can have. James compared the tongue to a bit that guides a horse, that controls a horse. He compared it to a rudder, which is a very small part of a boat, but yet turns a massive boat. He compared it to a fire, where with only one little spark, you can have a raging forest fire out of control, and it can do tons of damage, including property and lives. He compared it to wild animals that no man could tame, or that men could tame, that men are taming, but yet no man could tame the tongue. And some of those animals are poisonous. So our speech, our tongues, can deliver deadly poison to others. He also compared our tongues to a spring and to a fig tree and said, how can we have such inconsistencies? A spring does not produce fresh and salt water. It produces either good water, drinkable water that is good for life, or it produces bad water, which is not good for life. And a fig tree produces figs. It produces the kind of fruit that it was designed to produce. James said that no man can tame the tongue. But don't let that disappoint you. Don't let that discourage you. Because you can do things through God's power. He can. And that's what He's wanting to do through you. He's wanting to show you and your weaknesses. Because we are weak. We do stumble and fall. He wants to reveal His glory through us. And that's kind of where I want to start today. And that's why Barry read the passage that talks about being children of light. Start with a little story. There was a young boy who was guilty of running his mouth some, doing some slandering and stuff, as we're all guilty of sometimes. And he realized it. He was convicted about it. And he went to his pastor and he said, What can I do, pastor? And the pastor pulled out from under his desk this bag of feathers. He said, For each person that you've harmed, that you've talked bad about, I want you to go take a feather and put it on their doorsteps. So the young boy was eager to do what the pastor said, and he went and took a feather and placed it on each step. And he'd been a mischievous little boy. He had quite a few steps to put him on. We were all guilty of that. So he was kind of happy with himself when he came back. He said, well, now I've done that. We'll go back to the church and see what the pastor has to say about it. He got back to the church and was expecting something a little different than what he got. The pastor said, well, go pick up the feathers now. And he thought to himself, oh, okay. You want me to go back to reinform even more, reaffirm even more 
who I have wronged so that it, it will be a bigger impact on me. Well, to his surprise, when he went back, guess what he did not find? He did not find feathers. Because feathers can be tossed and turned with the gentleness of breeze and they're gone. So he looked high and low, but he didn't find a single feather anywhere. Disappointed, he went back to church. He didn't know what the pastor was going to say to him now. And the pastor said, well, what happened? He said, I could not find any of the, the feathers. And the pastor told him, so are the powers of words. He said, once you speak them, they're gone in the wind and the damage could be done. That's James's point when he said to guard us. James has five chapters. One whole chapter, 20% of his writing are just on the deadliness and power that the tongue can have in a negative aspect. But there's always a positive aspect too. We can't tame our tongues, but through God, we can start working on it, and He can tame them. So remember remember and think before you speak. There's a little thing, I think we put it in the bulletin last week. For think, it says to, um, be, if it's thoughtful, helpful, I'm doing this off memory so I don't get it necessary, kind, and maybe insightful. Those are things to think about before you say it. And if it's not one of those things, maybe you shouldn't say it. Well, speech should be something that's a reflection of our heart. It should be something that that shows our godly character, that reflects the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the light to the world. And he says, So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We're supposed to be a reflection of that light. We talked about James and we talked about Proverbs some last week. Solomon had a lot to say about the tongue also. Proverbs has 31 chapters. Isn't that kind of neat? How many days are in most months? 31 days. So I have a challenge for you. In the next 31 days, we'll take one month. Why don't you read a proverb a day? That'll take a 5 to 10 minute commitment. Okay? So how many of you will do it? You don't have to raise your hands. Think about it. Okay, now that's how people sucker you in. They get you hooked. Now that you'll give that 5 or 10 minutes, give 5 or 10 more minutes to prayer. Pray before you read the Proverbs what God is wanting to tell you, what He's wanting to reveal to you in His Word. And He'll ask you what you what you ask, He will answer and give you what you ask for if you get asked from the heart. And then when you're done reading, ask Him how you can apply those things to your life. And I guarantee you, if we will do that, especially as a body of Christ, that we'll see a difference in 31 days. So I challenge you that. Proverbs talks many times about speech. Not all of them are about speech, but you'll notice a pattern in there that speech is very, very important. Because how can we say one thing but live a different life that's inconsistent? And that's why you will hear people say, well, I would have been a Christian if I didn't know one, if I didn't see what they did. Because their words say one thing, but their actions say something else. And so many times, as James warns us, our words say something totally different too. Get us alone or get us in a small knit group. And a lot of times we go to gossiping, don't we? And we don't even realize that we're giving Satan that little foothold in our life. But not all of Proverbs are about ill speech, about things that hurt. A lot of Proverbs are about words of truth and the impact that they can have. Crying out to God in the fact that he'll listen and he'll answer. Healing words. Words are powerful, but they don't have to be negative. We can make our words positive and make a difference in this world. You remember what the purpose and theme of Proverbs was? In Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 3, Solomon tells you so that you know. He says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right, just, and fair. That's the purpose of Proverbs. So if we read that, and we take that and pray about it, and we put it into practice, then we should have a more disciplined and prudent life to know what is right, just, and fair. Wouldn't that be nice? Proverbs 13.3 says this, He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. James, if you go back a little further than chapter 3, if you go back to James 1... Verse 19, it says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know, I I was surprised when I read that. Because in my life, 
I am quick to speak because what I have to say is important. I am slow to listen because what you have to say, I might not care about. Isn't that human nature? But this is not what it says. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's what we're supposed to be like. That's how we're supposed to pattern our lives. The whole underlying theme of James was that we should live what we believe. If we don't live it, why do we believe it? Or what we believe, is it true? Is it a lie to us? If we don't put into action and words what we believe, we're living a lie. We're letting Satan be our God. We're letting him win the battle in the story, not God. James' main thought was that our speech is an indicator of the condition of our heart. How many of you, when you were growing up, heard your mom say, you say that, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. Right? Grandmother must have did that a lot more than that because she said it a lot more than mom said it. And and I don't know, my mom didn't say much bad, so she must have washed her mouth out a lot maybe. I I don't know. I never had my mouth washed out with soap, though. Thank goodness. I don't think I would like it. Now, my dog, I dropped a thing of soap from our boat the other day. I keep a, a bar of soap in the boat in case we want to wash up and go somewhere. And dropped it out of the boat when we were cleaning it up. And my girl lab, she loves soap. She just, I had to just keep taking it out of her mouth, putting it back, and she'd eat it again. So there might be something good about it, but I don't want to eat soap. But the problem is our mouth is not dirty. Our heart is dirty. Our words come from our heart. And if we're not focused 100% on God, wholeheartedly searching Him, the devil will get that little foothold in there. And that speech will come out. And that speech is not glorifying or not edifying to God. But we can have speech that is. You've heard people say that, well, I wouldn't have said or done that, but they made me do it. I wouldn't have done that, but they just did that that made me mad. Or the devil made me do it. Or circumstances or whatever. Well, i got news for you. If you're a Christian, none of those things are true, and you're not a slave to sin anymore. Romans 6, 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with Him. That means our sins were nailed upon that cross. They're gone. They're dead. So that the body of sin might be done away with. We don't have to let it be our God in control of us anymore. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. But remember, we can't do that. We have to be empowered through the Spirit to do that. We can't do anything, but through Christ all things are possible. Jesus Christ died so that we might live. Not so that we could survive, not so that we could live a life that we want to live, but so that we could live a life that would bring glory and honor to the Father. Not by our power, not by our strength, but when we learn humbleness, just as Jesus Christ did and humbled Himself and came to this earth and served people and then died for them. That's what we're supposed to reflect. David had this prayer, and I like it. I think we need to think about it, pray about it. Psalms 141, 1 through 4. O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense, like a sweet smell. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth. I need this prayer, I know. O Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. Let me not eat of their delicacies. If we pray that God will guard our lips and our mouth, our speech, He will answer it if our hearts are right. I don't know about you, but I struggle with it. That's one of the hardest things, and James tells me that it is, so I can understand that, is my tongue. It's not hard for me not to do this or that, but speech, you just say things sometimes that you're like, why in the world did I say that? Why did I do that? That was hurtful to somebody. That joke became out of control, or that thing that I said, wish you could take back, but you can't. Sticks and stones may break bones, right? But words will never hurt me, though they hurt. They hurt deep. But they don't have to. Here's an example of positive speech and what it can do. 
A teenager that bagged groceries said, I want to make a difference for God, but what can I do? I'm a teenager. I'm bagging groceries. I'm not out on the mission field. So what can I do? And he asked his dad. And he listened, like Proverbs said, listen to the instruction from your father. And his father said, well, what you could do, ask your boss first to make sure it's all right. And his boss was a Christian businessman. He said, take and find an encouraging thought or word, Bible verse, something that you got from somewhere, make up something yourself, write it down, cut it into like a business card size. And when you bag the people's groceries, you drop that card in their bag. And you tell them, hey, I put something in that bag. Didn't know if you needed it or didn't know if you not, did not need it. But I put something in there because I love you and I hope that it brightens your day. Well, what happened? People started going to his line to bag groceries. Well, that was a problem because now they had a teller over here with nobody and they had a teller over here with four or five people in line. So they got out there and said, hey, next aisle open, you can come over here. And the people refused to go wait to let the next person bag. They would rather wait in line to get that encouraging word because people are searching. People have a hole in their heart that only Jesus Christ can fill. And if we're not telling them about it, the world is telling them that they can fill that hole with drugs, with alcohol, with fame, with money, with whatever it is. And that's what they'll search for instead. If we're not telling them that they need Jesus Christ, then who's going to? Are the rocks going to have to cry out for us? So he did that. And noticed a difference in customer loyalty. Business went up. Guess what? It started infecting other people than just the customers, though. Some of the ladies in the floral department said, you know, we've got some of these flowers and things that we cut off and throw out because they're not perfect for the arrangement. Why don't we greet the women when they come in and give them a flower when they shop? Hmm. Let's well, look what that did. For long, the owners were giving food out to the food bank and stuff. The whole community got affected and changed because of the power of one individual speaking positive words. I don't know if it's a true story or not. I just read it somewhere. Could be, could not be. And I embellished upon it. But think of the implications that it could have if we lived a life like that. Instead of a life where someone said, ah, I don't really want to go to church. I know they go to church there. I, I know what they said the other day when I saw them and heard them. I don't want to be that. And I need your help being that. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. A body can't function unless all of its members are working properly. It's sick. It needs a doctor then. Jesus Christ is our doctor. He can doctor us up if we'll lay these burdens down at the cross. No man can tame the tongue. But through Christ, all things are possible. One person's words made a lot of difference in that story. We need individuals who will have an organized effort. That will stand firm with each other. Not talk about each other when they're down, but uplift. When I fall, be there and tell me I fell, but help me back up. Don't gossip about it. Say words that are positive, and I'll try to do the same. Say, we're not going to gossip. Instead, we're going to be a church who share words of life. Words are either evil poison, which lead to death, as James said, or words can lead to life. That's the kind of words that I want to have. That's the kind of words that Solomon realized we should have. That's the kind of life that Jesus Christ lived. You always say, what, did Jesus, what would Jesus Christ do? What did Jesus Christ do? If we pattern our lives after that, then we won't have any issues. It's a hard world out there. People are hurting. They're searching. And they need us to be loving and kind, and they need us to tell them why. Why we're different. That Jesus Christ loves them. Jacob encountered a boy that he used to um, go to school with this week. And it breaks my heart to hear a child say things like this. He went to Christian school with Jacob at Sandpoint Christian. And he's an agnostic now. Because he says it doesn't really matter. God is whatever I want it to be. He said, because people don't have enough faith and live out their life the way they should. So why do I think that that would be true? And Jacob said to him, he said, can't you see God everywhere? He said, I can see a creator, but I don't know that I see your God. 
I don't know. And Jacob said, well, if you die, you'll go to hell. He said, maybe, maybe not. Because our words weren't strong enough. Our actions weren't strong enough. He saw people who believed in something, but didn't live it. And I don't want to be that kind of person. Because this is a child that I know and love. And I don't want to see him die and go to hell. I don't want to see my enemy die and go to hell. Because Jesus Christ died for them all and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the kind of love that I want to have. So what about Jesus' example? What did he say? In Matthew 15, verse 7 through 20, he said, You hypocrites. And he's talking to the religious people at that time. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. Now when Jesus says this, that's what he means. Listen and understand. I'm I'm telling you this up front because this is important. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that that the Pharisees were, were offended when they heard this? And that's the first thing that happens when somebody wants to correct you, isn't it? I didn't do that. He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are, leave them, they are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Jesus was pretty clear. He said, Are you still so dull? So don't think Jesus didn't offend. He was clear to the point. Jesus asked him, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. So Jesus said it too. You can say James said it or Solomon said it or Paul said it. Jesus said it also. The things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what makes a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. We hear the powers of negative speech. We hear what negative speech is a reflection of. It's a reflection of our heart. If you're saved and you know it, then your life should surely show it, including your words. Is your heart clean or unclean? It's what affects your physical, spiritual life is your heart. You cannot be a disciple and draw others to Christ if your words and speech are not reflecting of the Savior. You're supposed to be like Christ. And Jesus said that about our speech. He also said this in Matthew 12, verse 35 through 37. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. I don't know about you, but that statement scares me. I know that I'm saved. But I've said a lot of careless words that I'm going to have to look Jesus in the face for and say... Give an answer of why I did that. Every careless word. I want my actions in life, my words, to show it. I want to be a child, a child of light. And that's the passage we read this morning. Ephesians four seventeen through 32. Paul gives us instructions as how to live as a child of light. He says, so I tell you this, and insist on it. So again, he tells us, listen up. I insist you behave this way. That you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have been given they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, with a continual lust for more. You, however, 
did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must, and he says it again, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but, which is a complete reversal, only what is helpful. So not only does he say not to let any unwholesome talk come out, he says, but you need to say things that are helpful, edifying, that will build up the kingdom, that will draw others to Jesus Christ. What is helpful for building others up according to their needs, not your needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Jesus Christ forgave you for every sin that you ever committed, for everything that you will ever do. He said, Father, forgive them. So if you're a Christian, you're called to forgive others. You're called to live a life with speech that will draw them to Jesus Christ. And Paul says in here, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives and resides in you. When you say and do those things, He literally is grieved. He is grieving that you're not listening to Him, that you are not letting Him lead in God. You are hurting Him. He is crying out because of your actions. The Holy Spirit lives in each and every one of us if we're a Christian. And He's there to do His job, which is to empower you, plus so many other things, to guide you, to comfort you, to heal you. And when your speech and actions are inconsistent with that, you grieve God Almighty in the form of the Holy Spirit. Paul also says to not let Satan have one little foothold in your life. A foothold is a place providing support, like for a rock climber, where they can get just their toes on or whatever to give them a foothold so that they can be not only secure in where they're standing, but so that they can advance further. So if you give Satan one little foothold where he can get his toes in, then he's going to try to advance from there. And he probably will. So we need to get down on our knees and not let him have any footholds. Give them to Jesus Christ. Lay them down at the cross. His shoulders are big enough to bear any burden. He says so. And then He will empower us through His Spirit to live a life where speech can edify and build up rather than to destroy lives. So I challenge us today to not only to not speak, as James warned us of, of things that can tear up and destroy and not let our direction and course of our life be set by negative words, but by positive words. A, hor- a bit in a horse's mouth and a rudder is something that's used for control. It doesn't have to be anything that's bad. That speech can steer a mighty ship and, t- and do mighty works. It can steer an animal that is six to ten times your size and you can enjoy and take that animal wherever you want to go. That's what our speech needs to be like. Speech that is glorifying and edifying. So I challenge you today to do that. I challenge you to read Proverbs with me and to uphold each brother and sister with your words and with your actions so that we can be a body of Christ that can make a difference like the story and that we can draw others to Jesus Christ. And I pray you'll do that with me. If you bow your heads. Father, we thank you so much for your words. Your words are clear. It's not us for up, up to us to pick and choose what we want based on our whims and our desires, Father but to be servants of a true living God. And you've given us the ability to do that through the Spirit, Father, that will empower us and guide us, give us everything that we ever need. 
And your word tells us that there's no temptation that's out there that is too great for us to handle, that you will make a way of escape. And I thank you for that. That is so awesome. You are a loving God, and we give you all the glory today. Help us as individuals and help us as a church to reflect Jesus Christ so that others may see our light and come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be reconciled with you forever, Father. We just thank you for this. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.